Good morning. My name is Kenny Hubble, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Palmacy of Presbyterian Cho uh, Church. And I'm joined by the Reverends Mike Peacock and John Debevoise. And we are um, continuing our Lenten practice of doing what we're calling a pastor's Bible study. And it's really our first chance to get into the gospel lectionary text for the week coming. And the idea is that we are interacting with this text for the first time. And we're listening to it, we're reading it slowly, we're getting a sense of uh, our first impressions. It's been a good experience the last few weeks, and we've particularly appreciated your feedback. And so if you have comments or questions about the study or our format and structure, uh, feel free to email me at kenatpalmacia.org, and I'll share with the group. We consider this uh, a devotional in a sense, that we come to reading scripture uh, understanding that it's holy and that we um, ask God to illuminate our minds and our hearts as we prepare the text. And so I've asked Mike Peacock to open us with a word of prayer before John reads the text. Mike's thing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we have thanks for the opportunity for fellowship as we join together this day to lift up in our lives text uh, that uh, lifts up the gospel in our lives. And we pray that you will bring the text alive for us so that we have an opportunity to interact with it and with one another as we attempt to discern the meaning for it in our lives so that we can carry forth as your true disciples in the world. Amen. Thank you, Mike. And just a note about our structure here. We will read the text um, and then leave some space between the questions. We ask three questions each time we we study the text together, and uh, the idea is that we are contemplative about it and have a have a moment to reflect, and we encourage you to reflect with us. And if we're going too fast, um, feel free to pause and uh, continue your own reflection as we move towards uh, answering these questions that that we lift up this, this morning. So, John, I'm going to share my screen so that you have the text, and when you're ready, feel free to um, begin. As he walked, sorry. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, "Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind?" Jesus answered, "Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must not." Work the works of him. we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am he. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then when I went and washed and received my sight, they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. 
So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now, that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do not see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. Thanks, John. Yeah, we are in this um, part of the Lenten journey where we're getting large uh, texts through John's gospel. We traveled through Nicodemus, then the Samaritan woman at the well, and now this blind man. And there's a lot to uncover in these texts, and which is why I think the, the questions that we offer help us to, to narrow our focus some. And so the, the first question that I'll, I'll have us linger on is what questions does the text raise for you? What questions does the text raise for you? John, Mike, any first impressions? I'll start. <laughs> I um, always find it interesting when I read this story why this story is lifted up. If we're hearing other stories of healing and miracles being performed by Jesus, what is it about this one that finds its way into the canon? Why is it here? Um, and uh, it, it, it's a powerful story, and I have lots of thoughts about why it is here once it is here, but as it compares to others, why is this the healing story that, uh, that we have lifted up here, and what was going on in the other healing or circumstances of healing or miracles being performed and how was the crowd responding to that here we have 
particularly the Pharisees responding with some of my favorite lines and the and the back and forth between the man and the Pharisees and between Jesus and the Pharisees, I I just find to be uh, fascinating. Uh, but 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 at the surface level, it's why is this one here? I find myself wondering, um, what's the connection with this man, with the community of John the Apostle? What's the connection of this man with the uh, community in the early church that would be hearing this story? Did they know him? This is a detailed story. And did they know him? Was he a continuing part of their community? I think the first question I get to in this text revolves around the way in which Jesus heals this man. Uh, so many other times in the Gospels, he simply speaks a healing. Um, and this is much uh, different and kind of peculiar uh, in comparison. And he makes this mud out of his saliva and puts it on the man's eyes. And I'm just really curious why there is such a change in pattern with this healing. Sometimes there's a touch, sometimes there's um, a physical element to it, but this this just feels a little different. I've, I've got questions about that. Other questions that this text raises for you in its first reading? It draws to my mind people who I have known who have been blind. Uh, when I read the text, about the man, I think of several people I have known, and always in the context of the community of faith, who have been blind. And I find myself wondering if people who are blind feel a connection to Jesus that's particular to them because of the stories of Jesus connecting to the blind out of the gospel. In a similar vein, I wonder where this text closes and Jesus speaks to those who say they see are blind um, and whether that's a, a spiritual blindness and um, those who have a sense of those who have the experience, John, like you're saying, of physical blindness and those who have the experience or maybe ignorance of uh, spiritual blindness. I, I'm I'm drawn to those elements. I also found myself wondering, is sarcasm at work here? Hmm. What's the place of sarcasm in the Christian community? Is there a place for it? And is this illustrative of sarcasm, especially from the blind man and perhaps from his parents? Hmm. I like to, based on what you're both saying too, uh, you know, in my original questions, I have known several people in the our faith community who were blind. John and I would share knowledge of some of those people at, at Palmasia, but also in my work life, I'm friends with a person who's blind. He actually does color commentary for the Rays, and although he's been blind essentially since birth, he has the ability to do that through gifts that are his own how he hears the game, how it's being played. And, and he has gifts that are far beyond anything that I would have uh, being a sighted person. He um, was uh, in the car one time with me. I may have shared this at our prior followers. And as we were nearing my children's school, um, he said, do you want to stop and say hello to, to, and he referred to my children by name. And, and he, but he's blind and he, there's no way he could have been able to look out the window and see we were passing my children's school, but he had that gift of knowing from where we'd gotten in the car and to where we were going, that in his mind, he was going through the process of the drive, having never seen it in the, in the sense that we would talk about seeing, but he had the gift to be able to know when we were in front of my children's school. And, and I think there's some element of that that comes to my mind as I read this story in terms of one of the gifts of 
of this person who was without sight. Mm -hmm. Our second question asks, where has this text shown up before in your journey, in the journey of the church or culture or literature? Where has the text shown up before? I hear in the text, the hymn, Amazing Grace. I, uh, you know, this I know, I was blind, but now I see. It evokes the lyrics to Amazing Gra the Grace for me. And that's a place where the text has shown up before. I'm seeing a parallel with our sort of modern culture really trying to um, get to the bottom of life's mysteries. And I see this, this miraculous thing happen in the text and um, the people trying to really understand and pull out every possibility outside of the miraculous, outside of this being a showing of, of God's grace or glory. And I just, I just uh, as I think about culture, but also where this shows up in the church, how, how often or how easy is it to leave space for something inexplicable and how easy it is to justify or try to explain things that maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, and maybe we should uh, accept as something greater. I'd, I'd like to be profound in terms of saying where this has shown up in my life before, but I have to be honest that while I find this to be powerful text, while like John, I often have images of hymns or pieces of music that, that come up. I hear what John says about I was blind, but now I see through amazing grace. When he says that, it, it makes sense to me. Um, it should have come to mind for me. But this is one of those stories that I've preached about before. I've enjoyed preaching about it. I uh, find it to be helpful text. I find it to be a uh, helpful text in terms of providing pastoral care. So I would have to say that I've encountered it there before, but it's not text that I want to say that I always make the connections of where I find it um, uh, connecting up in my life and other places. I can take the text out of it some of the lines that are that are my favorite, I guess, along with John's question of the sarcasm question is, uh, why do you keep asking the question? Do you, did you want to become his disciples? I, I like that answer. It's one of those, it's one of those uh, answers that appeals to the lawyer part of my life. And so there's a there's a certain common sense about that, where the parents and the and the man who's been healed are just talking about the truth of what's occurred. They don't have the answer for the why. They just have to accept the truth for what it is and the community's inability to just accept the truth. So I, I have to get to a level of analysis, I think, before I find out where this connects to where it's shown up in my life before. But I like it. Mike, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I It resonates with me when you say, I, I would say the primary place this text has shown up for me, except for the hymn Amazing Grace, and as background for some blind people I've known, uh, but it is also, it, it shows up for me primarily by encountering it through preaching. Um, you're, I think you're exactly right, at least in my journey, too. In fact, I wonder, would I encounter this text if it wasn't for preaching? That brings it forward. Unlike, say, the 23rd Psalm or, you know, 1 John, beloved, let us love one another. I don't find lines from this text being quoted uh, as punctuation in uh, daily activities or daily speech, even amongst the Christian fellowship. Um, and preaching is the dominant place, I think, where I have heard these verses. I think uh, an element of this text that's pretty subtle 
and moves on pretty quickly is when they ask him, the disciples ask who sinned, this man or his parents, and Jesus says, neither. Um, there's a couple places in the Gospels where Jesus kind of gets this question, and he explicitly teaches how um, sin and impairment or uh, sin and consequences are not tied. And for me, that's that's important and showed up early in um, my adolescence as a as a theological concept. Um, I came from a, a place in a tradition where I thought God was maybe doling out uh, judgment or consequences through sin. And so this text and a couple others um, is a little liberating for me or in the past especially has been in understanding that um, God's not orchestrating particular um, obstacles and challenges as a punishment. And uh, that that's just been important for me in my early walk of faith, especially. Our third question. For you, where is the text intersecting with life today? In your heart and mind, where does this text lead you? Where is the text intersecting with life today? Where does this text lead you? Can the text intersects for me um, even immediately uh, uh, in response to your last comment, the, the way the text illustrates um, clearly that uh, it was a common belief, even amongst religious authorities then, that burdens and challenges that came to you, such as blindness, were the result of sins. All right. And I find myself thinking, we don't think like that anymore. Uh, but then immediately, even out of your speaking, I find myself wondering, or do we? Do we still think burdens and challenges that occur to us are the result of sins? We do use the vocabulary of bad choices. Well, you know, he made a number of bad choices early on, persistently in his life, and those bad choices come with consequences. Are we saying something other than he sinned? What are choices but our willingness or our refusal to live out God's intentions for our lives? So it intersects for me in the inner dialogue of, do we still think um, consequences and challenges are a result of sins? In what way is that shaping us even beyond our conscious reflection on it? Yeah, to illustrate that point further, John, I had a, a family member, this was years ago, who at dinner shared with me that there was some questions about their future at the company that they've been working at. And uh, they sort of wondered out loud with me, oh, I should have, I should have tithed more. I should have given more money. And thinking that maybe this situation, the vulnerability that they were facing would have been sidestepped if they would have been more faithful financially. And they were just seeing, I think, a, a financial element of the, the larger conversation. And uh, but that was sad to me. This, this person is faithful, this person that I love, and this, this person that um, I think has, uh, has been generous and getting to a place where they have to overcome a, a hurdle or a vulnerability in thinking that that then stems from God, or even if God is uh, trying to teach them something through it is a is a difficult spot to be. Uh, that that's a that's a conflicting spot for me, um, because I don't want to say that God isn't ever showing up in in ways. Um, God isn't ever trying to teach us something in the world. Um, but as far as punishment and consequence, I think that's the rub for me, and and where that comes to a. a I wouldn't think that the story I just shared had great parallels with this text, but I, I just think it comes from a similar place of probably trying to understand 
adverse circumstances. It's God in control. It's God doling this out. And I think that's a, that's a tension for a lot of us still. I, I think I agree with that. And I think it's interesting, though, that I think we don't talk about it with sin language like you would find here. We we say it in a in a different kind of way, much like we would say, what did he do to deserve that? Or what did she do to deserve that? Or probably more often, what did I do to deserve that? And 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 it's the parallel to talking about punishment being linked with sin, but I think probably in common language today, it's more like uh uh, bad actions or potential bad actions or implicit bad actions or accusations uh, being associated with what has a bad result. I think it plays out in politics a lot today, um, uh, probably much like too much is. And in and, and, and good behavior and bad behavior and truth and non-truth and whatever else, take on these absolute positions and the ways that we react to them, similar to saying people who acted with sin in the past uh, have bad things happen to them or deserve to have bad things happen to them. And I think somehow in the confusion between politics and faith today, that uh, that's one of those kinds of things that occurs in terms of good behavior or right behavior and right results rather than bad behavior or bad thoughts and bad results. Mm -hmm. In your heart and mind, where does this text lead you? And I think at the base of that question is, what are we maybe doing with this text? What does this text compel us to do? For me, I, I come back to this image of, of the mud and the saliva and sort of the intimacy that's involved there, but also uh, get, kind of getting your hands dirty, the image there. Um, Jesus is working in that moment and is working healing and uh, I don't know if we ever really think about that being difficult, like if G if that's just so easy, um, but maybe it's not, maybe it is difficult, and um, Jesus is is leading in some sort of vulnerability, um, maybe weary of the judgment, I'm not sure, but I, I just look at that part of the text, and I think, oh, I need to get my hands dirty sometimes, I, I need to, I need to be in the mud, um, whether that's sitting with someone who is struggling or um, just being present. I'm not sure, but I want to be maybe uh, more aware of, of that feature of the text and, and what maybe God is calling me towards. That's a great line. I want to get my hands dirty sometime. I mean, that's worth plagiarizing in a sermon at some point with respect to this text. Um, did you just make that up, Kenny, right then? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Have you preached this text before? I'm guessing three years ago, I probably preached this text as it showed up in the lectionary, but I, I certainly haven't preached it more than once. Well, it's interesting. Three years ago would have been March of 2020. And of course, March of 2020 is famous, right? Because that's when COVID hit and we right. locked down. In particular, March of St. Patrick's Day weekend um, was when COVID hit. Um, I did a wedding, uh, which we saw through on a Saturday, and we did not gather at church the next Sunday. In other mm -hmm. words, we kept the faith with the bride and groom that we had committed to, but, you know, we went, um, we had already knew we were not going to be gathering anymore at the church. So, so however we might have approached this text, then it would have been in that context of illness and it's interesting to look at the emails that were coming out from my computer at that time, which were all assuming that by May, it would all be over and we'd be back to the normal pattern of things at the latest. Maybe we might have to go as far as May. So I wonder if you did preach this text in March of 2020, or if Mike or I did, or taught it, what, you know, it likely, I'm embarrassed to say this, but likely we probably abandoned it. If, that, if, if we were holding on to it and went with something more like, Psalm 45, a God is a mighty fortress or something to encouragement there. But um, 
it's I note that it the last time it showed up in the electionary cycle was not only in that month, but in the uh, Sunday of Lent that would have intersected with that phenomenon. I'm going to go look at my sermon for that week, which I don't remember what it was. Yeah, me either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but it's, uh, it's an interesting text because it's a text about illness, you know, and how interesting that would have been if it intersected uh, with that Sunday when illness is what we were working to prevent and afraid of. And we had this great focus on everybody washing their hands, which for health is good in general. But we had not discerned yet fully that it was coming from our breathing on one another. Mm -hmm. I and I think for me, where where in my heart and mind, where this text leads me, as I sit here right now and having reflected on it again now and having an opinion about it, that I like the text. I, I think this for me touches on the current issues in my life of. The truth and people not being able to accept the truth for what it is, and um, I think that's a there's an there's a sermon to be preached here about that. That we can act like the truth isn't the truth. We can attempt to ignore it. We can try to give other explanations for it. All of which the Pharisees and the crowd were potentially doing here, but the reality is this is a healing story of what Jesus did, and and what's the thing to take away from this is. Not only the what did Jesus do in this moment, but what does that mean? What does that mean about who he is? What does that mean about what we should understand about who he is? And so the truth is at the center of what this text is all about. I think that's very relevant, Mike. And when you say that, I find myself thinking, in part, I think that because it shows up the point you're making right at the first and second verses. Um, they come asking this question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 2, they're asking that question, which means they're bringing to Jesus an assumption that isn't true. I mean, mm -hmm. so yeah, he that's, that's addressed as a theme here right at the very front, and they can't shake it. They, you know, that they keep coming back to that. They can't shake the paradigm they have of the way the world must be. Um, and they, they, they are not able to shake it by the time they get to the end of the story, <laughs> even though he says explicitly, you know, in verse three, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents said, uh, that's, the, and, uh, I think your point's very relevant. Friends, this has been nice to do this first look with you both, um, this chance to get into this text as we travel through Lent to think about this story. I'm excited to to sit with this story a bit longer before I try to preach it on Sunday, um, but I'm grateful for this time shared together. Those watching, uh, we are appreciative of you, um, and again, you can uh, offer any feedback to me at kenapalmasia.org, and we would um, happily take your comments and try to um, structure things in a way that is most conducive for the community, uh, but we are blessed to have this chance to be in scripture together on a Monday. Um, thank you for your time. Mike, I wonder if you can close us with a word of prayer. Glad to. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to have come together and to have heard and lifted up your word this day. We pray that you will be with us in the week ahead as we carry what we've heard here today and thought about here today into the world. And we pray that we be guided to accept the reality of the truth wherever we find it in the world and not to attempt to push it away and define it by our own terms. Included among that, we pray that we'll be guided to understand and accept the truth of Jesus Christ in our lives and what that meaning uh, has for each of us and what that meaning has for the world. And that as we move through the period of Lent, we turn away from that which we need to turn away from and turn our attention to the Easter story as we move through this period and have the opportunity to lift up the significance of the text in our lives that we've heard this day and others as we move towards the reality of the resurrection. All these things we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us at this pastor's Bible study. We hope that you all have a wonderful week and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.